Truth. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm forbidden. Truth. I'm podcast. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm forbidden. Truth. I'm podcast. Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. This is part one of a two-part interview with Nebraska spree killer, Nico Jenkins. Nico was born September 16th, 1986, to David McGee and Lori Jenkins. Nico had a troubled childhood, being witness and victim to many traumatic events, first being hospitalized at the age of just eight years old. He had been in and out of juvenile detention and state care and mental health facilities starting at a young age. He suffered from anxiety, nightmares, and terrors due to what was going on at home and was eventually removed from the household and placed into foster care. Leading up until he turned 18, Nico spent quite a bit of time behind bars for various charges and mental health reasons. In 2003, after serving time in a youth detention facility, Nico was convicted of two armed carjackings. While in prison, he was charged with being a part of a riot in 2006 and assaulting a guard while on a furlough for his grandmother's funeral. Nico was released from prison after serving 10 and a half years, less than a month after being out on parole. Omaha would be gripped in fear from August 11th to the 21st, when Juan Urban Pena, Jorge Cajiga Ruiz, Curtis Bradford, and Andrea Kruger were killed in seemingly random attacks. On August 11th, 2011, a patrol officer discovered two bodies in a white pickup truck that was parked near a city swimming pool at 18 and F Street in Spring Lake Park. The two victims had been identified as Juan and Jorge. Both had been shot in the head, and their pockets had been turned inside out. The two men were lured there by two girls, Erica Jenkins, Nico's sister, and Nico's cousin, Christine Baudu, on the pretenses of having sex. On August 19th, around 7 a.m., the body of Curtis Bradford was found outside of a detached garage by a man returning home from a night shift at a convenience store. Curtis was shot in the back twice. It later came out that Curtis and Nico posed for a photo that was posted on Facebook a day before the murder occurred. Curtis was the only victim that was familiar to the Jenkins family. The fourth and final victim was Andrea Kruger. Her body was discovered on August 21st, around 2.15 a.m., by a deputy sheriff that had responded to a shots fired call. Her body was laying in the road, with multiple 12-gauge shotgun wounds to her face, neck, and shoulder. She had been on her way home from a bartending shift. Surveillance footage showed Andrea locking up the bar at 1.47 a.m. At 6.30 p.m. that night, Andrea's gold 2012 Chevrolet Traverse SUV was found abandoned 12 miles away. On August 30th, 2013, Nico was arrested on unrelated charges of terroristic threats. By the time he was arrested, evidence started to mount against him. Investigators had an image of a female associate on surveillance footage at a local gun shop buying the same type of ammunition, which was 12-gauge shotgun deer slugs, that had been used in the killings. Investigators gathered more video evidence from cameras that were placed along the route to Andrea Kruger's abandoned SUV. On September 3rd, Nico confessed to the four murders during an eight-hour rambling confession, rationalizing the murders to be a sacrifice of, to Apophis, the ancient Egyptian demon of chaos, whom had the form of a serpent. He was charged with four counts of first-degree murder following the confession, and handwritten letters dated November 3rd, 2013, submitted to the Omaha World Herald, prosecutors and a judge, Nico said that he wanted to plead guilty to the four murders. He would protect the Pophis' kingdom with animalistic savage brutality. In February 2014, he filed a federal lawsuit seeking $24.5 million from the state of Nebraska for wrongfully releasing him from prison and that his claims of hearing voices from Apophis were ignored. In a six-page handwritten filing, he stated being kept in solitary confinement was exacerbating his mental health. He put blame on corrections officials for the four killings. Nico claimed that his problems were caused by mental illness and that he had schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. The judge had ordered a psychiatric evaluation. The psychiatrist concluded that he had antisocial personality disorder and he was faking psychotic symptoms. After he was declared competent to stand trial, the legal proceedings continued. Nico represented himself at trial under guidance from his advisory attorneys. Throughout the entire trial, he claimed that he was under the commands of Apophis. He had many outbursts, speaking in tongues, howling, and laughing while prosecutors explained details of the victim's death. On April 16th, 2014, Nico Jenkins was found guilty of the four homicides. He was originally scheduled to be sentenced on August 11th, 2014. The sentencing was delayed to determine whether Nico was capable of understanding the death penalty proceedings against him. On July 29th, Judge Battalion ordered him to be housed at the Lincoln Regional Center Psychiatric Hospital until hospital staff were satisfied with his condition. 
In May 2017, Nico Jenkins was sentenced to death, plus received an additional 450 years in prison on weapons charges connected to the four murders. On April 20th, 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear Nico's appeal. Here's part one of my interview with spree killer Nico Jenkins. Where were you born? I was born in Denver, Colorado, and I moved to Omaha when I was like three years old, so I don't remember nothing about Denver. Can you recall the first positive memory you had as a child? First positive memories was of my mother always spoiling me. Like I was uh, my mom's only son out of five children. So she always um, went out of her way to spoil me and give me what I want. So I can just remember just getting toys that I wanted when I was like a little kid for my birthday, stuff like that. I loved Ninja Turtles when I was a little kid. So she used to buy me everything Ninja Turtles, like the pajamas, the blankets, sheets, and uh, toys, and, you know, just the little costumes, everything. That's basically the first memory I can remember. What about your first negative memory as a child? Probably was uh, childhood abuse when I was getting abused, um, getting uh, stomped in the ground in my head and uh, worked with stitching cores and thrown downstairs and stuff like that. And I was, that happened like when I was three and five years old, but I don't, I don't want to say who did it to me though, just because it was, it was, it was, uh, in my family, but I just don't feel comfortable saying who, who did it. Cause I don't want to, you know, put them in a bad negative light, but it happened though. Was that all the extent of the abuse or was there more that went on in the household? Basically. Yeah, that was it. Were your parents together while you were growing up? Yeah, my mom and my dad was together until about until I was turned to about like eight years old or seven years old, something like that. But it was kind of bad because my father was diagnosed with schizophrenia and uh, bipolar disorder as well. So he he would have a lot of smooth swings and outbursts, and then he was uh, drinking a lot. He used to abuse alcohol and drink. So. It made him kind of violent towards my mother. And Did you witness those mood swings and, and everything that that he would, you know, be yeah. be acting out? Were you yeah. were you there to witness that? Yeah, I witnessed. Yeah, I witnessed that stuff. And like my dad, um, he uh, he used to you know do illegal things to get money and stuff like that. But um, I just witnessed a lot of like like a lot of violence, a lot of fighting, a lot of a lot of assaults on people, people getting assaulted, people getting hurt. I had to clean up blood from the floor. I'm like just seeing people getting hurt from the time of a little kid, from like the age of three and five and up until the adolescent. Is that just from all the criminal activity that was going on in the family? I was forced more so forced to do it because of they that's just the way how it was. And it just was a part of normal life to me because I didn't know nothing else. Were you close with your mother, Lori, growing up? Yes, I'm a mama's boy to my heart, man, through and through. I love my mom. And I, shit, I slept in the bed with my mom since I was 12. <laughs> I'm a mama's boy. And I'm, I'm real close with my mother. Really close was with my mother. Did she have any type of mental illnesses or anything? No, not that I know of, not, not that it's being documented or nothing. How many siblings do you have? I have um, four from my mother, four sisters from my mother, and then I have a brother, two brothers, and two sisters from my father's uh, uh, previous relationships. <laughs> Were you close with many of them growing up, your siblings? Yeah, my big brother came down here since I was like seven, six years old. So I was close with uh, David McGee Jr. He's my dad's junior. You know, growing up, he was always there for me. He always looked out for me. He taught me a lot of things and just was there for me growing up. We've talked a little bit about mental illness, but can you talk about everything that you've been diagnosed with to date? 
schizo affective bipolar type. Schizo affective means basically that I'm a schizophrenic with a mood disorder. So I have the worstest diagnosis that you, uh, someone can suffer from because of the, they're, basically I have to be treated, like even me taking my antipsychotic injections and I'm refusing to take mood stabilizers, I still have episodes, psychotic episodes of mutilation of myself and like um, outbursts of uh, verbal uh, psychotic episodes, like rants and stuff because of my mood swings. So basically, yeah, that's what it is. And that's what schizoaffective bipolar type means that I'm a schizophrenic with a mood disorder. When were you diagnosed? Since about 2009. How old were you then? Uh, 35 now. So 2009 was what, 10? I was like 22, 23, 22. What was your behavior like as a child growing up? It's, it's, since the time of being a, being a little child, like I remember having uh, psychotic episodes, like having uh, voice commands things telling me to do things bad and like everything that I did in my history in my childhood, like I started fires, I did arson, I would steal, I would assault people. Like the things that I would do, I was doing everything off of voice commands. Like even I stabbed my sister Sophia, my oldest sister, when I was twelve years old, off of a voice command in her knee. I stabbed her in her knee. But, like, I can remember even back then, like, she would tell you, like, if you asked her if she was to do this interview, she would tell you that I didn't, we didn't fight or anything. We didn't have any kind of disagreement. I just came in there and just stabbed her and left. And once I got older, they revealed themselves as demons. But, like, back then, it was just voices in my head that told me to do stuff, and I didn't know what they were. Like, I used to even, like, kill animals, like mutilate squirrels and rabbits and stuff, and like, uh, and gouge their eyeballs out and stab them in their stomach and pull their guts out and carry them around the neighborhood in uh, clear trash bags and scare the kids on the bus stop. Like, I didn't even want to do it, but the voices was telling me to do it. And like, they would, kids would get off of the bus, like, these were like, junior high and high school kids and they would be scared and like it was just like i can remember like even stuff that i used to do like that like just very uh very uh disturbing abnormal type things that you can tell this was after i got out of the hospital too so because i was in a psychiatric hospital when i was eight years old and i got committed for 14 days what was that experience like for you for me, it was torture because of like I was get, I was in emotional distress, so I was seeing more. I had more hallucinations, and I was getting more voice commands. Like I see black spirits in my room, like um, and I was hearing more voice commands and stuff like that. And I was like beating myself up, and that was the first time I started having uh, self harming behaviors where I started hitting myself and pulling my hair and stuff. And this was as a child. Yeah, this was at eight years old when I got committed to uh, Richard Young at Methodist Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. Were you just physically violent towards everybody? Were you just out of control or was it just something that was like blown out of proportion at the time? No, that was that was very true. Like I was basically um, having a lot of psychotic episodes and uh, because I was a face that abuse, that physical abuse, and basically, you know, I've done extensive research into neurology and um, the catecholamine neurotransmitters where the region of the brain of the hypothalamus where where mental illness lies is believed to lie in a neuropeptin uh, catecholamine neurotransmitter and cortisol is the stress hormone. So basically when I was being abused, when you get hurt or you get any kind of uh, experience any kind of discomfort in your life or distress, the stress hormone cortisol begins to secrete. So I think that the chemical stimulation of the cortisol 
was being absorbed into my catecholamine and my neurotransmitters and may causing my mental illness to disrupt and that old, that high level of cortisol stress hormone was causing my my brain to try to recompensate and secrete more um epinephrine and, and norepinephrine. These are excitatory secreting uh neurotransmitters. So it's like adrenaline. So like they like basically that's what was causing me to have these 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 outbursts because I had so much adrenaline coursing through my veins and then I had the stress hormone and I was depressed. I was getting beat. I was, you know, forced to do criminal stuff because of my demons. Or the voices back then, and they would like the demons would scare me at nighttime. Like that's why I was so scared at night always. Like as a child, like because like if I didn't do enough bad stuff during the day, the demons and stuff would tell me they're gonna get me at night, and I would literally feel them touching me, like touching me and shocking me, you know, making me pee on myself, like touching like I could feel it and like I used to tell my mom all the time when I was young when I used to see him and I used to feel him and my, nobody would believe me you know but I was still like man it was just it was so real to me though were you telling anybody else besides your mother at the time yes my aunt Corvella Carter she raised me she when my mother was working um this was my dad's sister David McGee's sister, her name was Cordella McGee, but she got married, so her name changed to Carter. And um, she raised me, and she was, those were all my childhood memories that were positive and good. Like, she never yelled at me, never whooped me. Um, you know, uh, she just loved me and treated me good. My aunt, my aunt is the one who got me, my mom that sent me to the hospital because my aunt was mentally ill too. She had um, schizophrenic as well, I mean, bipolar disorder as well. And uh, my dad and my aunt, because my, my mental illness comes from my dad's side of my family. So, yeah, they told my mom that I should, I should get committed to the hospital and that I should, she should get help for me. And like she did, my mom did. My mom was always trying to get help for me, man. Like, even before I got out of prison, um, my mother filed a, a, a petition with Johnson County Attorney to, for the Board of Mental Health to review me and it's in a commitment to a psychiatric hospital, but they never did because the, the prison system lied about the, the prison psychologist, Mark Wallace, lied and withheld my evaluations and my records so that I wouldn't get committed. But my mother tried. She tried to get me civilly committed. She did everything she could do as a as a citizen to do it, but they just they got sabotaged. Can you tell me about Apophis and the goddesses that you see Apophis. or and or hear? You know, and does that date back to childhood? Well, back then I didn't know their names. I didn't know their names. I just knew that they were voices. And, but then once I got like 21, 22, when I was in solitary confinement, and then they revealed themselves to me, and then they told me the demons and stuff, and they told me that they've been my whole life, and they've been monitoring me and telling me that I'm their sacred king and that I'm supposed to resurrect the uh, the kingdom of Hot Ships with Queen Hot Ships with the Egyptian queen, because I guess she was like the first Egyptian queen that was a witch. Like she used to work, uh, she was of the grimoire, you know, the underworld. And they said that she was believed to to control the demons. And they say that the demons tell me that I'm her, for, I have sacred Egyptian royalty bloodline of that kingdom, of Queen Hashipsu, 1453 BC. And I started doing blood rituals, blood magic, and stuff like that, and worshiping them. When did you first start hearing the voices of these spirits, which you said were later demons and later these gods or goddesses? Oh, I, I heard them as a kid, as a kid, as a kid, so, since I was like five years old, from the earliest time that I can remember. What was it like the first time you heard it? It was, it was scary. It was scary because it was at nighttime and I was, I was outside in the nighttime playing. And then it got dark, and then I started hearing things. Like, I thought there was somebody hiding in the dumpster because we stayed in an apartment complex, and I thought there was somebody hiding in the dumpster, and I looked into the dumpster. 
I climbed up the uh, side of the fence and looked into the dumpster and was looking around the dumpster, and I didn't see anybody, but I was hearing the voice clear. And that's when I got scared, and I told my mom. That was the first time, but she brushed it off. And then I was telling my dad and my my, my family, my sisters, and they just all just were saying, stop playing make-believe games. They thought that I was just playing a make-believe game when I first started telling them about it. Was that the norm during your childhood is there wasn't many people that believed what you were experiencing was real? Well, up until eight years old, until I got eight years old, then I got committed to the hospital. Then that's when my mom, like, after I got out of the hospital, I had nine months of psychotherapy sessions with a psychiatrist named Jane Dalkey out of Omaha, Nebraska. And um, I was under medication, and um, she stated in my, 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 my second competency here in June 10th of 2014 that off of the same evaluations that you have in your possession, she would have diagnosed you with a child form of bipolar if, if she was ethically permitted to do so. But she said that in 1995, you couldn't diagnose children with bipolar disorder. It was unethical and unprofessional of a psychiatrist to do so because there was no neurological resonance imaging that's like the MRI of the body. Uh, it's of the brain, though. That's how they see the the disconnection from the right from the lobe of the brain, and um, and there are the chemical imbalance as well. So, yeah, she testified to that in the transcript. That's on the transcript, so that. Off of those same evaluations when I was eight years old, she would have diagnosed me with a child of form of bipolar. She was ethically permitted to do so. So you go to this psychiatric hospital, you're eight, then you get out and get eight months or so of therapy. What happens after that? Do they follow up or they, do they just let you slip through the cracks? What happened after that? Basically, I slipped through the cracks. My mom stopped taking me. My mom stopped taking me because my dad was threatening my mom. My dad was threatening my mom because I was taking medication, and the medication was making me more calm and more uh, relaxed. So I didn't have as much high energy because usually when I would go to my father's, I would be very high energy and, you know, telling my dad about what I do at school and, you know, little things that I do. Because my dad he was like, he was like, he would give me positive praise for negative actions. So it made me want to be bad. He would, like, if I would beat somebody up, he would make me act out how I beat the kid up, like, and show him what I did to him, and he'd be laughing. Like, so he would he would constantly reinforce, you know, big, strong, aggressive, dominant, you know, be, 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 be violent, be, be dominant, you know what I mean? Like, so when I start taking the medication, the medication took that away. And so my dad thought that they were trying to kill me and thought they were to poison me. So he basically was behind my mother to stop taking me and stop putting me under the medication. So basically out of fear of my father, my mother stopped doing it. When did your criminal activity start, you know, as a child? Was it around eight or was it before then? It was before eight. I took, well, I took my mother's gun to school when I was in like the, uh, when I was in like the uh, second grade for River City Roundup. What kind of like, gun was it? It was, another, it was like a 25, a 25 pistol, 25 uh, millimeter. But um, um, that was like the first time besides like shoplifting and stuff. And then after that, I got out of the hospital. It just got worse or like, um, you know, like arson and assaults and you know, theft by receiving stolen cars and stuff and just a lot of stuff that I was hanging around older kids and you know, basically being influenced by that older doing older things that I shouldn't have been doing. But I was just very uh, ahead of my times. Like I always hung around all the adults, so. I always acted older than I was. 
besides the carjacking, were there any other violent crimes that you were committing as, when you were coming up as a teenager? Were they just petty, you know, like burglaries or shoplifting? Yeah, or... yeah, just petty stuff. Just petty stuff. Let's talk about the charges you caught when you were 16, how they came about and, you know, what the aftermath was and everything. That's one of the other things that's the same, same situation. Um, voice commands telling me to do those, those things and commit those crimes. And, and I was untreated for my mental illness. And I was just following the commands of the voices that was controlling me. Do you remember specific things that these voices would say to get you to commit these crimes? They would just tell me like things like like this is what we need. You need to do this. This is what's gonna make us uh, make us happy. Will we will uh, will be able to drive around and go do things and be able to go do this and go do that. Just little. It's just like little manipulation tactics they would say to me that will just make me. Cause I was always I always liked to drive. I always liked to drive when I was young and growing up. So. Uh, that was one of the things that kind of entire in, in, uh, interested me when they started saying that stuff. Whenever you went and do things that you would hear, you know, them telling you to do, you know, would, would that exacerbate anything and everything that was going on? You know, when you just ignored it or, yeah, or they didn't, make, didn't do so? No, if, if I didn't listen to them, they would just scream and yell loud and then it would just drive me insane like it would just drive me crazy and i would just start saying everything that they're saying and just my behavior would start getting weird i start because i would be in such a frenzy and so agitated that i couldn't even talk to my mom i couldn't even talk to my sisters that i would be very aggressive and violent towards my family and loved ones and friends and just everybody just because it, because i wasn't doing what they told me to do and my mind was so disturbed those charges you caught when you were 16, were you charged as an adult? Yes, I was charged as an adult. Uh, I actually did the crimes when I was 15, and I got charged for them at 16. Three months, 16, when I got arrested. So were you, were you being held in a in a, an adult jail, or were you being held in juvie at the time of your trial and everything? I was in, a, I was in the Douglas County Youth Center in the juvenile detention center. What age were you convicted, let alone sentenced to prison and, and you know, showed up in prison? Well, uh, I was sentenced to prison at the age of 16. I went to prison at 17. So I was in prison from the time of 17. Were you housed with other offenders that mean you were a juvenile or were you like segregated in PC or? Well, in the state of, in the state of Nebraska, in the state of Nebraska, they have a like a youth prison so like everybody here is under the age of like 20 so they people would be like from anywhere from 15 to 20 years old and the, but the 20 and 19 year olds were in a different mod and then the younger 18 and under inmates were in a different mod and I went to the adult prison at 19. Well, they, they sent me to the adult prison at 19 because in the state of Nebraska, you're an adult at that age. How did you spend your time in prison the first time? Well, I used to get into riots and fights and assaulting guards and stuff like that. But basically, all of that violence and all of that stuff triggers um, my mental illness. And I mean, it's, I mean, all of the violence is, is birthed from my, my psychotic uh, symptoms and my, my, my untreated mental illness. Hold on real fast. Let me grab something real quick. I'm grabbing my, because uh, they have an IMO, involuntary treatment medication, and I want to read to you what my psychologist says about that. It's crazy that you just brought that up. My psychologist from, from the prison system name is Brandon Hollister, and he has to always in, submit a uh, like a narrative for why I should be on involuntary medication treatment. And it says, um, he says, I can actually send you these documents too. It says, danger to others is evidenced by, and then it says, gives the history. Uh, it says, Mr. Jenkins presents with a significant history of aggressiveness and homicidal ideation related to mood, 
in psychotic symptoms, and he has reduced his aggressiveness and homicidal ideation since initiation of an involuntary medication order in April of 2018. I recommend additional treatment with involuntary injectable antipsychotics to further reduce his agitation and delusional beliefs about NDCS staff, especially as Mr. Jenkins has a history of medication non-compliance and he has failed to comply with voluntary oral psychiatric medications. The reason why I wanted to read that is because it's um it's 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 it's, an, it's another mental health professional, a psychologist that says that my violence and my my aggressiveness and you know the homicidal ideations and all is because of my untreated mental illness. But because I've been under my in, uh, involuntary medication order, I've been uh I've been doing well, you know, and I haven't hurt nobody or nothing like that and, and since I've been arrested, you know. But I still have those uh, mutilation of self from time to time, you know, because I struggle with that part of it. Was the forced injections, was that a thing the first time you were in prison as well? No, it wasn't. That that was one of the reasons why that I, I, if they, that's what they should have done because I don't want to take my medication. They should have put me on a... Uh, involuntary medication order like I am now. Did you have any access to mental health services when you were in prison the first time? Yes, I, I had access to it, but my doctor, they moved me away from my doctor and then the doctor that they had me at NSP before I got out said that I wasn't really ill. And I, she only met with me for like 20 minutes. Her name was like Dr. Cheryl Jack, but, um, all of the other doctors that I ever ran across, Dr. Olivetto, Dr. Jane Dawkey, Dr. Bruce Gutnick, Dr. Martin Wetzel, Natalie Baker, I got the list goes on and on. I got like Dr. Taylor Overtusen, I got like six or seven, like almost 10 psychiatrists and psychologists, they all come to the same conclusion. And these are different psychiatrists from different backgrounds and stuff. How would you say your overall experience in prison the first time was? Well, I was being mistreated and stuff like that. Like they would use uh, pepper spray to spray me when I would not give them my, my personal property and drag me out of my cell with a spit sock all over my face and spray me with so much full of pepper spray that I would urinate on myself. And they put me in a room. They put me in a room with just a blanket and a mattress and a boxers and T-shirt and socks on my back with nothing else for like months at a time. Literally, like three months at a time, I would be living like that. So you're paroled on July 30th, 2013. Do you believe that you were prepared to be released into society? Of course not. If you know my case, um, you would understand that I didn't want to get out, and I told him that I didn't want to get out. But listen, man, let me break this down for you, man, because I want you to. I want this is what I want your listeners to know. This was a governmental Nebraska conspiracy against one man to deny him mental health treatment based off of racism, based off of discrimination, because of what I, who I was and I, I committed violent acts towards them in their prison system. Basically, my doctor was psychiatrist Natalie Baker. She diagnosed me five months before I was released in July of 2013 with affective bipolar type. She stated that Nico Jenkins is at this time mentally ill and dangerous and will be needing a civil commitment. And this dude named Mark Wallace was a psychologist. He wasn't even my psychologist, but he basically was the hitman that was hired by then Nebraska Department of Correctional Services Director Robert Houston. He was hired as a hitman to 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 kill my civil commitment to the county attorney of Johnson County. My mother, Lloyd Jenkins, tried to file a civil commitment complaint with the Johnson County attorney. She did, actually. This initiated this this Richard R. Smith dude, county attorney of Johnson County, where the council prison is housed at. He called up here to the prison and said, is Nico Jenkins really only dangerous? The dude, Mark Wallach, this is all on transcript, man, September 18, 2014, in front of seven Nebraska senators, this dude, Mark Wallace, got exposed and admitted that he withheld my psychiatric evaluation. He had the evaluation to say that I was mentally ill and dangerous and schizoaffected affected by a public type, but he said that he did not have it. He said that I was receiving mental health treatment, and I wasn't. 
I was being held in 22 hour day lockdown and I wasn't being treated. And then basically, this is where the conspiracy comes into play is because if he would have gave that report to the county attorney, uh, uh, Johnson County attorney, Richard R. Smith, I would have gotten from the Board of Mental Health and I would have committed myself. And this is what I want the public to know. This is what I want everybody to know about Nico Jenkins. If I could do this all over again, and it wasn't a conspiracy about me getting the treatment that I deserve and getting in front of the Board of Mental Health, these people would still be alive because I would have told the mental health judge, Apophis wants me to human sacrifice. I don't want to do this. I need treatment. I need to be in the hospital. Two total papers. That's the guard. I was doing a supply card. But um, at least that's the real. At least you guys know I'm in prison. But, um, yeah, um, but like I said, I would have got myself committed. I would have got myself committed in the states and Nebraska law. I had the power to commit myself, man. But that's where the conspiracy came into play. And then they didn't give me any medication. They didn't put me on forced injections. They didn't give me no mental health treatment as far as therapy. They didn't lead me to no therapists and no clinics, none of that. And then another thing, this is another thing that I want the public to know. Not only did they know that they were releasing a mentally ill and dangerous, psychotic, violent inmate, they called Omaha Police Department and told Omaha Police Department, Nico Jenkins is out today, he's getting out today, and he's most likely going to kill somebody or cause harm to somebody. They called the police and told Omaha police this. The, and I know this because October 1st, 2013, at my preliminary hearing, Officer David Snyder, 1822 badge number, stated that under sworn old testimony. This is in transcripts. So not only did they know what they were doing, it was, it was premeditated because they called the police the same day that I got out. Who does that? You know that I'm really ill and dangerous, and you know you're supposed to civilly commit me to a hospital so I'm not dangerous. You got a person begging for help, begging to get treatment, telling the system, I don't want to get out. This is what's going to happen. The, telling them a whole delusional system, Andrew. I'm telling them a whole delusional system. The whole thing, everything human sacrifice, poppers, knockout, Felicio Sauce, kill and destroy, tattoo, red ink on my face. All the things that they wanted me to do, telling them everything. And they just ignored it. They just ignored it because they didn't want to treat me. They felt it was too much money. When you did get out on parole, were you receiving mental health services, you know, the, the weeks prior to the, the crimes that occurred that you're in prison for now? No. They would just come by and, and ask me, like, are, are you going to kill somebody? Are you suicidal? And I'd say no. And they just keep going. That's not treatment. So, no, I wasn't getting any treatment. How were you spending your time the two weeks before everything happened after you were paroled? Well, first I was I was uh, just going uh, just going around visiting all my family that I missed, like aunties, uncles, cousins, um, working out at 24-hour fitness gyms, um, uh, just spending time with my family, stuff like that, and just going through it, like locking myself in a room with guns and just – being uh, detached from reality. Let's talk about August 11th, 2013. Can you tell me everything that you remember starting out with how you started your day up until 11.59 p.m. that evening? I don't, only thing I could tell you is that basically I was sleeping during the daytime. I was nocturnal at night. And basically at nighttime, I'm just basically chanting in a psychotic, delusional state, chanting the demons, chanting the prophets, um, just ranting about human sacrifice and the war revelations is upon us, stuff like that. That's what my whole day is, is recycled of. So there is no experiencing things. And the only reason why I was working out, because that's a part of being a superior soldier, and being a superior soldier of a prophet, that your body has to be in condition to to destroy. So basically, that's what it was. And like from the crimes, I know what you're going to ask me. From the crimes, I don't remember things during the crime. All I remember is what I was chanting and what I was hearing my own voice of the demons in the prophets. And I can tell you that 
but the beginning and the end is the only thing that I remember. It's what I was doing at the beginning and the end. That's all I remember. Do you remember the end being that they were dead, or do you remember just was it not like that in in, in your mind? No, I just the, at the end, I, the end that I remember is that I just remember the that my my hand my hands were were like sweating, they were shaking, and just I can just keep hearing the delusional voices like of the of of, of of the the system, my delusional system, the system that how it goes, like pops, like worshiping the pops, like a kata gula pops ala zem da ula al kuwa, a kata gula pops ala zem da ula al kuwa, and then they're just repeating the names of the demons, Avomalek, Belial, Asmorias, Azazel, Sarvuti, Tarki Machi, Kaune, Bechau, Fimosnes, Beos, Alalel, Belzebal. It just keeps going on like that. That that cycle, like worshiping the poppers, the demons, the demons, and then them talking to me. Like that's that's basically what just keeps going on and repeating and repeating and repeating. So you don't really remember how you got there or like how you ended up with the gun that day or anything of the sort. You just remember the champion and everything. No, I I, I remember all that stuff, but it's like. To me, that stuff is that stuff is not the the what this case is about. What my purpose is of telling this story, man, is is my case is my case is to try to get help for other people that are mentally ill, man. People that are getting done wrong by the system and that are going to be released, and the same thing can happen to them that happened to me. And it's not about glorifying killings. I don't, I don't want to glorify the killings. I don't want to glorify doing them things that these demons and evils and this mental illness get to me, what my purpose is, is to expose the governmental conspiracy behind what happened to me and get justice for myself. Because I'm supposed to be in a psychiatric hospital. I'm not supposed to be in prison on death row. You know what I mean? And I'll tell you, though, like I said before, about each one of the murders at the time of the killings, my this is all going to come out. My girl cousin, Christine Bordeaux, she witnessed these murders, and she's even saying it in the recording. She's telling the police crying, telling them that Nico was talking in some other kind of language. That wasn't him. That wasn't him. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know what he was doing. He was always talking about sacrifice. That's all about to come out very soon. So everything that I'm saying now is going to make sense to people later. But the main thing is, the main concept is that I'm not the monster that this system try to create through me and they wanted me to be this way. They wanted me to be psychotic. They wanted me to be murderous. They wanted all of these things so they can try to pass new laws in the state of Nebraska when it comes to uh felony sentences and all of that stuff, man. Just it's just crazy because they start as soon as I got arrested, like the senators used me to bring back the death penalty. They did all kind of stuff, man, like in the state of Nebraska. Like it isn't even, they try to pass new laws to uh, make stiffer penalties for felonies and stuff like that and good time laws and take away our good time laws. And they try to pass a lot of different things on my name, but it didn't happen because the conspiracy got exposed, exposed. In regards to the crimes that were committed, you said that the first two, you didn't really have any recollection other than the voices and everything, right? Yeah. Was that the same with the other two as well? Yes, it's the same same concept with each one because it's basically the what I told you about the uh, chanting of Apophis and the demons. That's basically what I'm what I'm chanting as it's happening. Like in my girl cousin Christine Bordeaux, she told the police this in an interview, crying to the police officers, and that's that's one of the things that was ineffective counsel on my attorney because he failed to subpoena her to my death penalty trial and to put that in the evidence. But I watched that DVD myself. And speaking of that, five of the co-defendants, actually, three of them were your family members, right? Yeah. Are you able to talk about who played a part in what? No, I can't I can't speak to those things because people's appeals are in and, uh, you know, my appeal, and that's, that, that could um, directly affect that, you know. So I don't feel uh, comfortable speaking about those type of things, but 
basically, you know, um, it's a lot of things that's in the media that's not true, man, that was spent around by the media. And even the testimony that people that gave that were involved, they only gave that testimony to save themselves and to, you know, so a lot of that stuff is not true. What did the media get wrong? They got basically all the stuff wrong, you know what I mean? Like, they try to say that my mom bought bullets for me. That's not true, you know. Um, just a lot of things that, that are not true in my case, man. Um, just in general, like my sister Erica Jenkins, she was never with me on any of the murders, you know. Um, they, they try to say that, but she wasn't. Do you think there's any misconceptions about you or your family for that matter? Yes, there's big misconceptions about it, the whole situation, about what happened and how, like I said, it was a governmental conspiracy against me to not get me mental health treatment and let me get sent, sent to the hospital. And um, I I wanted to save people's lives, and they, they took away my only opportunity that I had to save people's lives to get in front of the Board of Mental Health and admit that if officers was consuming me and that these things were going to take place, and that would have got me sent to the hospital. There's actually in Nebraska law, 71-925 uh, or 924. And uh, they, it says it says that in law that if I'm in front of the Board of Mental Health and if I admit to anything to being mentally ill and dangerous, that treatment must begin. Treatment must start, meaning you be at inpatient treatment in this um, Lincoln Regional Center in Nebraska state psychiatric hospital. So that was one of that was one of the reasons why the the government of the prison system conspired against commit uh sending psychologists to deflect the Richard R. Smith, the county attorney of Johnson County, they deflected him to file the Board of Mental Health commitment because they knew that if he would have did that, I would have gotten in front of the Board of Mental Health and I had the power to commit myself. Literally, like it doesn't even matter what doctors say. And that's the thing that I want people to know the most about me and my situation is that I would have admitted what was going on. I told everyone, like I was writing to doctor's office, offices that I didn't even know, telling them everything that's going on to them, buzzing to state senators, to everyone. Like I was telling them what's going on and telling them that I wasn't getting treatment and I wasn't getting help. Do you think at the time, if you would have got mental health treatment and were taking medication and everything of the sort, that all this might have been prevented? Oh, of course. That's it. That's for sure. Everything would have been okay. I would have stabilized. I would have been okay. Like I'll give you an example that, like, I'm I'm stable now and I'm nonviolent. But like before my prison sentence, before my ten and a half years before I got out on the five nine four seven eight, I was violent. I attacked guards. I attacked inmates. Uh, I started riots. Um, I did a lot of things because I wasn't medicated and it was psychotic episodes. But now that I'm medicated, I have direct access to the guards every single day and to other inmates. And I haven't hurt anybody since I've been arrested. That's because I'm under medication and I'm getting, I see my psychotherapist Monday through Friday, Brandon Hollister. He's a psychologist here at Tecumseh. He's the head psychologist in Tecumseh. I see him Monday through Friday. On, on psychotherapy sessions. So he checks in on me. He gives me a chance to vent frustrations and tell him the voice commands, what's going on, how everything's happening. And then I get this uh, this medication, this once a month injection that's been helping me to be stable and now i And like you I think- said, I have direct access to the guards and to inmates every single day. I'm not in chains. I come and go as I please and it's in and out of my cell. Do you think anything and everything that you do there with the therapist and everything helps, you know, keep the voices away and any, you know, violent tendencies or anything that you might have? Yes, the the, the treatment that I'm receiving right now is the treatment. The only thing that I have a discrepancy of is where I'm being housed at. I should be housed in a skilled nursing facility at the hospital instead of being on a death row mod. But um, basically... Everything that's being done right now, I'm getting treatment that I should have got before, and that's the type of attention that I need, you know, from from a psychologist, like, and my psychotherapist, 
because that's what he gives me on a Monday through Friday. And sometimes he comes in on the weekends because he's a mental health OD. So he'll see me on those days too sometimes. That was part one of my interview with Nico Jenkins. Thank you for listening. Unforbidden truth. I'm, 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 Unforbidden truth. I'm, 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 I'm,